Hi, Paul Thompson here from Spitfire Audio. I'm going to give you five tips today on how I program orchestral percussion, especially this kind of action-y stuff uh, that I did for the uh, Abbey Road Orchestra low percussion trailer. So a few ideas about the way that I program percussion that I've picked up over the years. First thing I want to do is show you the mixer. Um, really just to show you that there's no reverb or anything on the, I'm using pretty much most of the time the uh, mix that Simon Rhodes created as mix one. It's a fantastic all purpose mix. I love it across all of the instruments. And it's only when I'm doing something really specifically different that I start digging into the mics. You'll see that I've got a low subharmonic uh, synthesizer, low air, on two of the channels for a specific effect. I'll tell you that when we come to that. But apart from that, everything is pretty much coming out of the plugin as it sounds on mix one. So the first idea that I want to give you is contrast. Um, when I'm writing this kind of piece, rather than having lots and lots of kind of interlocking things that are gradually coming and going, I love the effect that you can get by really having marked contrasts between the sounds. So I'll just play the opening and you'll see what I mean. So you can see just even in those last two and a half bars that we heard from bar eight onwards, we're really switching between two different types of sound, two different types of performance, two sets of, of drums. Uh, anything that you can do to kind of engineer block contrast, I think is really great. And this is um, an idea that I kind of picked up probably in bits and pieces from things like the original Mission Impossible score. I mean, that's the opening is a kind of my little homage in my own head to the opening of Danny Elfman's Mission Impossible score, the first one, um, where the, you've got, that's obviously snare drums, but you've got that kind of contrast of the of the uh, either side. Uh, it's the question and answer thing. I love that contrast. Um, it's something that Hans Zimmer does in lots of his scores. It's like a kind of block of stuff and then you brutal change to something different. It's a it's a really great and simple and easy way to kind of make things sound exciting because your ear doesn't have time to get used to anything. So contrast first up. So there you can see there's a time signature change. It's a really simple one. And this is the second thing that I want to talk to you about is not only time signature changes, but also tempo changes. Now, time signature change is great for throwing the listener off balance slightly, um, for allowing you to move more closely to the picture when you need to, so that you can slot in different bars of different lengths and it doesn't sound too strange then, rather than if you were going along in 4-4 the whole time and then you suddenly have a 7-8 bar immediately before a cut. That's a bit of a dead giveaway that you're trying to hit the cut. Now, um, if you kind of throw in lots of time signature uh, changes throughout the piece, I think it you know, where it works, it helps you to create a more interesting piece because you're keeping the listener off balance again, making things exciting, what's coming next. But also it gives you uh, some nicer variety in the rhythm track. Now, this is a super simple one. I just wanted to put a two beat uh, kind of break in a sense into into the th into the proceedings. But what I do later is I combine this with a tempo change and I'm just going to bring up the tempo uh, here, so you can see the tempo change that happens here. And then um, as we go through, you'll see there's a couple more uh, time sig changes. And then we have a tempo change again back to our original uh, place of 4 4, same as the opening. And then, you know, a little bit of a tempo change just as we go into a, a final section. But um, what's the effect of changing the tempo and the time signature at the same time? Well, let's just have a quick play from this point here. It's interesting that you can kind of change the tempo and the effective beat. Uh, the tempo has gone up, but the effective beat seems to have dropped back slightly. But then we've got a slightly more complex 
uh, rhythmic figure. So it's a change across uh, three different functions in the music, and it and it really gives you a kind of jolt. It really makes a kind of real clear change. And it's um it's an interesting trick if you want to let's say you're going along in four and then you want to introduce something that feels more swung or more triplety, you can do that by changing the tempo and the time signature at the same time. That's it's a it's a great way of experimenting with the perception of the listener, and it gives you a lot more tools in your toolkit for changing the feel of the music. So that would be a great example there. Now here we go from a 4-4 to a 7-4 via a 2-4 bar. So I'll just play this section. And again there, when we go, when we drop into the 6-4 and then back to the 4-4, it's again throwing you off balance slightly um, already before and the way that the accents are falling. And again, it's about variety. It's about throwing the listener off balance, um, which keeps everything sounding exciting. It stops you getting too used to what's going on. Again, we drop the tempo, but the apparent beat has gone up. The apparent speed has gone up. Um, back into that kind of exciting straight 4-4 stuff. And then at the end, really, the tempo changes just to bring us down slightly to um, elongate the end, make it a little bit of a ralentando. Now, I haven't had to worry too much about, you know, I'm just stepping down. I haven't tried to design a nice curve in the tempo because there's nothing else happening in those bars. It's just the one beat on the on the head of the bar. Um, if, if things were happening and, and everyone was slowing down, then you would have to obviously shape that slightly more carefully. And in those circumstances, an S curve uh, works really well because you start to you start to um, shape off the tempo and then it accelerates a little bit or decelerates rather at, um, faster and then you even it out as you get towards the end. That's a common thing actually that I, I learned early on. I was shaping all of my tempos like that and I was ending up with really struggling to get to the point where it was slowing down enough as you were ralentando towards the end of the, of the piece um, without becoming painfully slow at the very end and I very uh, quickly learned that an S curve is the way to go and that gives you uh, you know gets you down in tempo um, slightly earlier and then allows you to smooth out the final uh, beats of the bar. So that is the second tip. Now if I open up the uh, side panel here and we look at our quantize information you'll see that the quantize is off here. If I scroll down through the tracks off off. Ah, now we've got that star, which means we've got a combination of things happening. And if I just look at uh, one of these, you'll see that we've got eighth note quantization on that on that one, and then eighth triplet in that uh, swung section. And these are just quantizing straight. Now, if we look at this channel uh, on the bombo here, you'll see that I've changed the quantization strength. So the, the question is always, um, should you quantize? orchestral stuff, percussion, orchestral percussion, uh, should you not? And if so, how much should you quantize it by? I try to uh, perform the music into the door without quantize, and but I will hang the, uh, if I've got something that's very, very heavily rhythmic, you need something to hang it on. You need a kind of, you know, when, when it's this kind of thing, you need a, a some, parts of the music to be quite rigid and then you can kind of get your groove and your kind of feel around playing stuff with less quantize um, or with no quantize around that. Now the frequency content of the sound will sometimes determine how I approach uh, quantizing or not, um, the groove, all of that kind of stuff. When you've got the really lower frequency instruments like the bass drums or any kind of um, you know super low frequency drums that don't have a very high frequency attack portion, um, they tend to sound better, slightly looser, because that is naturally sounds more natural to your ear. Um, when you've got the very high frequency content in the attack of the drum or the attack of the sound, 
for me, that's when it can become very messy very quickly. So taking this Bombo track uh, as an example, and let's play this solo so you can hear what's going on. Now, as you can hear, it's not totally accurately in time. In a couple of places, it's slightly off the beat. And that is part of the thing that gives you a kind of feel. You know, it's not, um, and I'm not talking about a specific, like one feel for everything. So it's all swung in a certain way or anything like that. Um, I'm talking about a, a feeling of a group of percussionists performing together. It's not all going to be super tight, locked in. Uh, there's going to be some musical expression. And some of that expression comes out in the in the kind of, slightly behind the beat occasionally, maybe slightly ahead of the beat occasionally. And if you can perform that into your door, you know, either using the keyboard or using drum pads, um, I think that you end up with a more, more musical result. But you do have to have something that is, uh, in this kind of action music, that is fairly rigidly quantized in time to give you the kind of overall pulse. If everything is unquantized, it can start to sound a bit messy. Because the one thing that you lose when you're performing everything on your own is obviously the cohesion that happens when a group of musicians find a groove and find the beat together. So we're sort of, you know, nothing is going to sound as good as that, but we're sort of trying to model that effect. We're trying to get that musicality into the track. So if I unsolo that and you f kind of listen out for that bombo, Now, if you look at this, and, and uh, this is an example of kind of mixing things up a bit, you'll see that we've got the eighth and eighth triplet as our selection for the quantization. And that enables us to get this, these kind of um, blends. So uh, you're, you're crossing the straight rhythm with the triplet rhythm at the same time. And that gives you this nice effect here. Which almost sounds kind of flam-like, but it's a little bit more precise than a flam. So... I, I will mix things up, even when I'm quantizing, I'll experiment with, um, you know, it might even be, you know, even greater subdivisions of the beat, 30 second notes, um, looking at crossing triplets with, with straight patterns, um, and then experimenting within that of having some parts that are unquantized. So I might, I might go in and uh, I'd say I want oh, the overall performance to be quantized, but there's a little section here where the way that I played it, the kind of groove that it had, means that I go in, I select those notes, and I unquantize them using the functions menu here in Logic. And all doors have this ability to undo the quantization. So you can keep anything that really felt good, um, and then you can get the rest of the track uh, really very tight. So that's a, that's another uh, another interesting way of looking at quantization. Now, the final thing that I want to talk to you about in quantization is when you are doing a kind of um, a kind of swell, a kind of exciting build, even if it's a little short one like this. Okay, so that sounds kind of interesting. We've got a bunch of different stuff happening there. But if I just start uh, highlighting a few of the tracks and we look at them all together, let's just zoom into this bit here. Now you'll see that there is, um, if I kind of flick between the tracks, so we're, we're looking at this kind of last beat in a sense. And if I just go through and you look at the way that these are being either quantized or not quantized or triplets against uh, you, you know, there might be stuff in there that I've unquantized or there's triplets against against straight beats. Here is an unquantized section here. Uh, you can see quantize is off. And this is, you know, um, it's off the grid. This kind of thing makes it sound more realistic and more exciting because as you are, as everyone's getting excited, they start to play slightly ahead of the beat or slightly more out of time. And everyone is going hammering towards the the big hit you don't have lots of transients all lining up you know they if you lined up all the transients uh, of every subdivision of every beat on this um, the overall effect would be disappointing and in fact I'm going to show you that now so here it is as it is now let's just select everything 
and let's apply the same. I'm going to leave the triplets in, but we'll apply the same quantization to everything. OK, you hear the difference? It's let's undo that. It doesn't. It's lost a lot of its excitement. Listen to the listen to the original version. It sounds natural, it sounds exciting, it sounds uh, like a bunch of drummers hitting, you know, doing that little fill before the, the big hit. Um, th when we quantize it very heavily, all the transients are lined up, it all becomes a bit smaller and a bit less interesting and a little bit boring. So it's that blend of, um, you know, of, of, of quantizing enough so that you get a, a nice clear and solid beat, but then having enough loose stuff around it that it sounds cool. It sounds like, you know, you've got a groove that you, you're, you know, you've got players actually playing it. Um, so that's quite in depth, but I think it's that's one of the things that you really need to focus on and um, play around with and experiment with. It makes a huge, huge difference to your programming when, especially with rhythm, uh, when you start to mess with the quantization and, you know, and experiment across this kind of, a uh, really kind of wide variety of different combinations of things that you can do. Now that takes us nicely into tip four, which is uh, what, what do I prefer? Recorded swells, rolls, you might call them, or played swells or rolls. Now, recorded rolls are great, but for me, they have two really standout uses where they're very good and very useful. And for all other elements, I prefer to play my swells and rolls um, so that I have as much control as possible over both the uh, dynamic shape of them, but also the exact timing of each hit within the articulation itself. So where do I think they excel? I think uh, when you have a uh, constant uh, roll that is like a, a kind of drum roll or a timp roll at a specific dynamic, and it's and it happens over an extended period of time, so you have this kind of... Um, Or so you've got that that thing where you need an extended or even a very long, you know, you know, it's a it's a it's a kind of sound color. That's great, and I love them also for the kind of or that kind of kind of rough. I think we call them. Um, that kind of stuff is really great as well uh, for using those, especially when you have the soft takeover switched on here, um, which enables you to use dynamic to control the actual roll or playing that and then going to a hit um, can really be quite useful. So with that sound, that, that's really great and that works really well for me. When it comes to a uh, swell like or... I get more control from being able to shape that um, by using the individual hits. And that is my absolute preferred way to do the, these kind of swells. Um, it just sounds more natural. And if I want to make it faster, I can go in and I can tweak the MIDI. I sometimes do that after I've performed it to get something that really uh, exactly matches ex what I want to do. It might be you know, the shape, the curve of the velocities that you're using. You Do you want it to sweep up suddenly to a hit or do you want it to kind of build and even get up quite quickly? And then, you know, just going like that over to the to the main hit, you get so much more control um, by playing those swells in. So that's my preferred uh, technique for, for doing swells. So you'll notice amongst uh, these tracks, there's a couple of things where I've put low, there's alts, rights and lefts. Let's talk about that stuff. So the first thing, and this only happens right at the end for these big hits, is I just wanted a little bit of a kind of slightly over the top sub boom within the, um, the sound for these last two hits. And this is the kind of thing, this is the kind of processing that you can make your own really great subby, you know, that that classic filmic sub boom sound It's all done with things like this, tuning things down or using um, subharmonic synthesizers. In this case, we're using low air, which is a waves plugin. And as you can see, it's got this kind of uh, 
It's got this the, these different components where you can add in the octave below and you can change the range that it affects and all uh, you know that it's using to to produce the effect and all that kind of stuff. So it's great fun to play with that. And it's really straightforward and I've just added it onto these last couple of hits. Now when you are looking at these other things down here, let's have a look at and see what I'm what I'm doing. So with these dolls, I've got a straight uh, patch here. So if I go in and show you this section where it's really it's really all kicking off. Um, and then I just zoom that up a little bit. And if we just uh, focus out a little bit so you can see what's going on here. So we've got the pattern is kind of it's coming and going between the different the different instruments. If I click between them, you'll see there's elements, there's different components building up the rhythm. But I've made uh, duplicates of the actual instrument and I'm tweaking it to get a specific effect. So what am I doing? Here is the, the kind of main doll. And for this one, I've added a little bit of the close mic. So you've got a little bit of that extra crispy punch. Here, we're just using the low sound. Uh, and again, I've put in a bit of the close mic. And this is where it starts to get interesting, where I've created an alt-right sound. So you can see here, uh, first up, I'm panning on the front panel. I'm using the vintage pop close and the spill mics. And that sounds like this. Now, when you add that in to the uh, original signal. So what am I getting here? I'm getting two interesting things. I've pitched it down so it's slightly lower, but also um, we're getting a slightly kind of laggier response. We're using a different mic profile. So the, the frequency profile is different. And I've kind of continued that theory so we've got the low version here, which is doing something slightly different. It's got the same mic profile, as you can see. And, and again, it's panned, but it's, it's producing a slightly different rhythm. And again, if we look at these two, uh, you'll see that they are separate performances and that I haven't quantized either of them. So. Again, we're, this is the kind of area where we're looking at um, getting at something that sounds quite tight, but not super tight so that it gives you that size. And then the beauty of it is as it goes in and out of time, you're hearing that lovely flamming effect. Um, and then we've got a couple of extra bits here. So uh, panning over to the left this time using close to and outriggers and mids. Um, that's the only uh, ones we've got active on here. And I've also panned that close to mic over as well. So I'm getting a really super directional sound from this. Check this out. And if you look, I've got a slight tuning change, but I'm tuning it up slightly to just uh, crisp it up a tiny bit. And then when we look at the low version here uh, for our low element of the sound. I'm tuning that down a bit. Again, it's panned over to the left. This is our left hand band, if you like, and we're using the same mics here. And that sounds, uh, let's put those in together, sounds like this. And if we add in uh, these ones as well, and if we then add in the two uh, at the top, So all things that are really, really simple to do, and you can take your one instrument and you can create a fantastic ensemble by moving these things around slightly, doing a little bit of work on the tuning, playing them in separately, maybe quantizing part of it, but leaving enough of it unquantized so it does sound like a group of drummers. And you can create your own ensembles like that. Got a huge amount of mileage for this section out of um, just messing around with those basic controls there. Now, the other the other element of making ensembles uh, without doing the tuning tricks and things like that is really, really super simple. It's just using the different articulations um, and you can use these as I am here. Mix one and on this articulation, 
mix one. So I'm not even messing around with the mics. I'm just using uh, the different articulations as different instruments, different players, different elements in the arrangement. Now, obviously, if you're if you're if you know the piece you're writing is going to be performed live and you only have three percussionists, you have to be a bit more pragmatic about it and write for those percussionists. But as far as I'm concerned, if this was being recorded for film or TV, um, then I would simply leave some of the samples in and have the players play along um, so that I could get that variety. Or, you know, if, if it's an entirely in the box creation, then you've got that fantastic variety of sound. As far as I'm concerned, anything goes. If it sounds good, it is good. So all of these extra beta types that you have give you a whole new instrument as far as I'm concerned and use that to the max, experiment with different combinations of sounds, putting different parts on different beaters and seeing how that affects things. And you will find that, you know, from a set of instruments, you very quickly expand out into a huge tonal colour palette of sound. Um, and that is when things get really exciting. So that's a look uh, at my low percussion um, trailer music. Uh, let's play it through and I will flick between some of the tracks as we go so you can see the whole thing from start to end. So that's my finished track. Hopefully there are some interesting ideas that you can take away into your own programming from those five tips, especially if you're lacking confidence in programming or orchestral percussion. Um, just experiment with these with all of these things that I've been talking about. And I think you'll find it starts to come together and you start to get you know really interesting sound world from it. Thanks very much for watching. Look forward to seeing you on the next one. Bye bye.